Now, um, we're going to basically talk about in this part of the module uh, how to annotate variants and prioritize them in relevance to, uh, uh, and also some in part two, talk a bit more about uh, some uh, enrichment analysis. But let's focus on the, the goals of today's uh, learning objectives. Uh, so basically, we want to understand uh, what variant annotations can I use, um, how do you understand the impact prediction models that are out there, and then we're going to use in the lab one of these tools called Anavar, which is kind of like a one-stop shop for uh, variant prediction. Um, so um, first we'll go through a few introductory slides about variants and genes. Um, so one thing to consider is two different levels, is the gene itself and the variant. So the questions we're looking at is the gene central uh, to um, a biological process that may well be related to cancer or another disease. So things something like uh, cell proliferation, apoptosis, uh, or an extracellular uh, matrix de degradation. And then things, other, other things to consider is whether the gene is sensitive to a particular perturbation. So uh, if you think of the diploid cell, if you take out one copy of the gene, uh, does that impact on the role of that gene in the cell? Does that contribute clinically to the disease? And then the variant, we're, the question we're definitely asking is what the effect of that variant has on the gene product itself. So essentially the study of human genetic variation has kind of both a, um, an evolutionary significance um, as well as clinical applications. And we're going to focus a little bit more on the, on the latter. So there's different types of evidence to consider when we are um, um, talking about variants. Um, variant recurrence or frequency, uh, the relative frequency of an allele um, in the population um, and its percentage across the cro all chromosomes in that population. And then things like gene product function. So what's the, what's the, what's the role of that gene itself? Uh, is it contributing to a biological process or a pathway? And then finally, what we're going to be talking about here is the effect or to determine the effect uh, of the variant uh, relevant to the transcript and the protein function. Now there are different types of variants out there. Um, our focus today really is going to be on small variants, 1 to 50 base pairs, um, but it's also good to be aware that there are larger variants um, entities out there. So typically a small variant, single nucleotide variant, um, usually it's a, a base pair substitution and with using next generation sequencing techniques, it's relatively straightforward to detect. Um, things that are a little bit more difficult and challenging to detect are the uh, small indels, insertions and deletions. Um, and there is a, a wide variety of databases that I'll be introducing to you earlier, uh, sorry, later, I should say, uh, that will allow you to map uh, the variants uh, to very exacting coordinates within the genome. So I won't necessarily go through the medium or the large uh, variants, the information's in your notes there. Um, now, in terms of annotation or variant annotation, uh, there's different things we're going to be talking about, about today. Um, we'll talk about the different variant databases that are out there. Um, there's three different categories. There's e that's based on the type of information that they capture. So um, there's a allele frequency uh, from uh, reference data sets. Uh, these are like a thousand genomes, and uh, the ESP database, and the exome AC database. Uh, there's also dbSTIP, which is a resource that adds CPI, which captures a lot of uh, variant data across all species. Um, there's COSMIC, which is more specific to cancer, um, and it's actually a very widely and useful resource. I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the gene mapping techniques. Um, also the gene product effect type. Now, this is the impacts, for example, the loss of function, the gain of function, um, miscess mutations right there. And uh, then finally talking specifically about different algorithms that are used to identify and uh, predict the outcome of uh, missense mutations. 
And then there's other scoring effects that are out there. There's additional algorithms that can take into other genomic features that I'll present as well. So let's talk a little bit about the variant databases, the analog frequency databases that are out there. So the first one is the 1000 Genomes database. Um, this is actually probably one of the older databases that's out there. Um, essentially, it's a global project to uh, catalog variants in the population. Um, they've been very uh, leading edge in terms of developing software and tools and the data formats for exchanging uh, variant information. They're currently in phase three um, of the project. Their real goal is to here is to identify all the variants with a greater than 1% frequency uh, in the human population. Uh, it's using, it has oh, just over 2,500 samples, or subjects, I should say. Um, they're apparently healthy. Um, and the ethnicities, because it's a global project, capture uh, the different groups, population groups around the world. Um, the sequencing platform that they're using is Illumina. Um, in the early stages of the project, they were only able, just because of the high cost of sequencing in those days, they were only basically able to do about two to four times of the genome coverage. But now as the sequencing costs have dropped, uh, they've now been able to uh, sequence to much greater uh, coverage. Another very useful resource is the uh, NHLBI. And that is the National Health Laboratory, or National Institute of Health, uh, Lung, uh, Brain, and um, I think they also do, actually, sorry, National Heart, Lung, Brain Institute. Sorry, I get too much, too many acronyms with NH, NIH. We are actually, React Home is funded by the NHGRI. I still can't understand what that is. Um, basically, the goal here is to identify variants relative to different uh, heart, lung, and blood disorders. Um, although in this case, they're looking at a frequency of less than 1%. Um, they have a slightly different subject population in the case of uh, they're actually looking at uh, not necessarily healthy people. So obviously these are people with a different heart, lung, and blood disorders. Um, and they do have different uh, subclinical traits that they can actually track and monitor as well. And they have quite a lot of clinical data with that, which is actually very useful in terms of data analysis. Um, the ethnicities, um, they're focused quite, they're not as diverse as uh, 1,000 genomes. Uh, they're looking at Afro-American and European-American populations. So it's mostly a, a US-based project. Now, their platform is a little bit out there, taking the approach rather than using whole genome sequencing just to be sequencing the exomes. Um, and their average coverage is very high at 110 times. Um, the EXAC database, the Exome Aggregation Consortium, again, another large US-based project. Um, it's actually being led by the Broad Institute uh, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, basically, their job here is to harmonize the exome uh, sequencing data and summarize a lot of this information and make it available for uh, researchers around the world. Um, and their, their goal is to compile the largest set of exomes ever, and they're actually doing a pretty good job of getting there. Um, their subject population is a bit bigger, 60,000. Um, now, again, not necessarily healthy individuals. They're focusing on cardiovascular disease and immune disorders and some other neurological diseases, but also cancer as well. Um, um, but I have been informed that they've removed certain individuals from uh, different uh, data sets. Why that is, I don't actually know. But again, the, earth, the distribution of the ethnicities within the population, uh, it's kind of a global population of people. Uh, the platform is uh, the Illumina Exelon platform, and they're using the particular variant calling uh, GATA K. All right. Now, again, another old database. In fact, I think it's younger than it's younger than me, but uh, it's been around since uh, the mid '90s. Um, this is dbSNP. Um, this is actually a database capturing variants across all species. Uh, it's a very large, com uh, a very large collection of variants. Um, sometimes a little bit overwhelming, I would say. 
Um, the only the one very good advantage of this database is that it's integrated in with the other uh, NCBI resources, so it's very easy to find uh, relevant uh, supporting annotations and literature citations that are associated with these uh, SNPs. Um, the other thing just to point out is that it, is a, it does have a relatively good lookup service for variant information. Um, I do find sometimes, although, that the filtering uh, criteria, though some claim are good, I find them a little bit challenging. Um, and you do have to make sure that sometimes you remove certain flagged uh, variants when you're looking for certain uh, population, certain variants within the population. Uh, another very, very good resource is the uh, Catalog of Somatic Mutations and Cancer. This is COSMIC. Uh, it's at the base of the Sanger Institute in the United Kingdom. Um, they're basically cataloging a uh, number of data, uh, number of somatic mutation variation somatic mutations in cancer, create a very large uh, reference database, a very nice user interface. Um, they are capturing a variety of um, variant data from systematic screens. This is from the Cancer Genome Atlas and also the International Cancer Genome Consortium here based at OICR. Um, they also, which is nice, uh, capture a lot of m expert manually curated uh, variant data as well, which is actually very useful uh, when you're screening through a lot of variant information because there's there's clearly a relationship between the genotype and the phenotype there uh, with all the relevant uh, cited sources, publications, and that's actually a very valuable resource here, particularly when you identify a variant of interest. Um, the important thing to mention is that they're also capturing the frequency of which the gene is mutated as well. Um, some resources don't necessarily provide that information or they don't necessarily provide that frequency information for all variants. COSMIC does a very nice job of that. If I seem like I'm blasting through these slides, please raise your hand and ask the questions. Oops. Okay. I'll just go back a slide. Excuse me. Let's go here. So, oh, I did actually. Sorry, I apologize. Gene mapping. So, now we want to talk a little bit about some of the kind of uh, methods that are being used to identify uh, different uh, gene loci and obviously things like the distance between genes. Um, so, Essentially, there's different types of things to consider here when we're talking about genes. Obviously, the focus really here when we're looking at uh, missense mutations is, or here, is, is, is the, protein, the location within protein coding genes. Uh, this makes it much easier to look at the impact of certain variants. Um, and then also non protein coding RNA genes that are like typically microRNAs. Um, and some of the kind of caveats really refer to the kind of different functional relevances. This is basically um, things how like large changes in expression may well be a consequence of particular um, variants and likely different variants in different cells um, could potentially have similar impacts but also you can also expect that different cells will have the same variant but have different impacts based upon different biological processes being affected by those variations. Um, and we will kind of address a little bit about that in, in uh, some of the talks, uh, sorry, the, the talk tomorrow, um, when we actually consider the impact of variations on biological pathways. Now, when mapping to, when we're uh, mapping to the gene. There's different parts of the gene to consider here. Um, um, there is um, the, the untranscribed region. It's obviously not translated. Um, sometimes it's difficult to predict the impact of a particular variant within this location. Um, it's much easier to predict the impact of uh, 
variations within the coding exons, uh, and to some degree within introns as well, if that has an impact on splicing. Um, whether an exon is, in, well, sorry, whether an intron is spliced out or whether the uh, exon is included or excluded from the final transcript. Um, other things to consider are areas further upstream of the transcribed gene uh, and also downstream as well, and then the intergenic regions in between. Now, um, the system that we're going to be talking, we're going to actually be demonstrating in the lab later, um, is is Anavar. It has quite a nice uh, priority system. Um, as I said, it's one, like, Anavar is one of these one-stop tools for annotating variants and examining the functional consequences uh, on the actual gene itself. You can infer a variety of different uh, other genetic features like cytogenetic uh, bands and you can apply different algorithms and look at the functional impact scores um, of those variants. Um, just looking at the table here, um, Hanavar follows this different priority. Um, so obviously the default is to the exome. Um, and then a variety of different values are applied to different uh, gene features or gene parts. Um, <coughs> splicing, non-coding RNAs, UTRs, both five prime and three prime, intronic upstream, downstream and then the intergenic region itself. And what Anavar tries to do is to reduce um, the number of mutations, basically from a larger data set, filtering it through a variety of different gene parts, different algorithms down to a, like maybe a hundred or in some cases a handful of um, significant uh, variants. Um, the actual mechanism is, is as follows. It removes things like frame shift mutations. Um, it focuses on conserved regions within genes. Um, it will remove things like segmented duplications. It will also remove some other variant data from 1,000 genomes. Uh, SNPs may well remove uh, dispensable genes. These are genes with high frequency loss of heterozygosity. Um, that are typically found in healthy patients because they're not necessarily going to have a clinical relevance of that variant. Okay. And this is just a slide just to show the kind of priorities placed on different sections of the gene. Um, now, So, to map variants to coding and non-coding genes, um, there's a need for uh, a reference nucleotide database. Um, in this case, um, and in the end case of Anavar, we're going to be using uh, RefSeq. Um, this is traditionally one of the suggested uh, databases of transcribed genes and coding sequence definitions. Um, there are other databases that are known. And each database will have their own kind of reference, sorry, will have their own genome browser. So there is UCSC, uh, and there's also Ensemble as well. Um, and your choice is entirely up to you. It's your, how you're comfortable with some of those genome browsers as well. Um, I should carefully watch what I say in case I incriminate myself because I'm recording this. I personally like UCSC. It's been one of the resources that has been around for a long time. Um, but then again, I've, I've curated for a previous database that I curated for. We focused a lot on RefSeq data. So it's actually very, again, very useful because it's integrated into um, a lot of NCBI resources. And then Ensemble is a nice European tool. I preferred the old interface, and then they, they suddenly changed it. And all the features that I got used to became default, uh, not necessarily what they were. The default features all changed. I had to then select all of the features that I wanted to use, and so I, I found. So I've said it. I have my piece. Um, now let's focus a little bit on um, gene product effect. Now here we want to understand the actual. You know, when you're when you're doing a lot of there's a lot of experimental work out there, and you can study specific variants. 
because of the basis of the the, 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 the contribution of that particular uh, gene to a particular uh, function, like an interaction or some kind of assay, or based on three-dimensional structure, we can use information to understand the actual gene product effect or the chain, how that variant changes can have an impact on a biological process or a pathway. So there are uh, some regulatory effects. Um, sometimes these are difficult to establish what change means. Um, obviously, some cases are easier. If it's known where a mutation is and it's within a domain, then you can potentially say that, well, if this domain is a mutation and this domain uh, structure is changed and it no longer binds to an interaction, then there's the impact. Um, typically, that occurs most of the time with protein coding sequences. Um, and I would say, for the majority of the time, it is easier to chase after the protein effects. When you start looking at UTRs and intergenic regions, it's sometimes very difficult to understand the impact uh, of those variants. And in fact, there's some studies that even show that once you get out of like small populations and you actually go to global populations, a lot of those initial studies kind of break down and you no, no longer find uh, the same uh, significant variants uh, related to a particular clinical phenotype. Um, there. Um, typically, when we're talking about uh, the, role, the change that a variant makes on the protein coding sequence, a variety of different types. Um, there's a stop gain, which is basically just adding a stop codon, which causes a truncation of protein. Now, in some cases, that may have clinical impact because, and just as an example, say like notch one, if you have a truncation within the, in the C terminus of the protein and you no longer have the pest domain, that protein is no longer being degraded, so it actually will stick around much more. So a particular stop codon can have a dramatic effect. And actually that, that particular class of mutation has been linked to um, ALL and AML, which are two forms of leukemias. Um, there's also a frame shift uh, indels. So basically we're seeing a shift in the reading frame um, and obviously from that point forward, protein uh, translated incorrectly from that point. Um, that obviously has particular uh, impact if the, the C-terminus or you're in the protein has a particular uh, domain and you no longer have that domain, um, which was involved in a kinase activity or an interaction with another protein. Uh, splicing, uh, so you will affect there whether um, whether you're, you're uh, going to have a splice event, actually have a splicing event, or whether um, you do not. Uh, there's also in-frame indels, which will remove um, or add one or more amino acids. Um, again, if that's in an unstructured part of a protein, there may not necessarily be effect. But again, if it's in a domain, that may have a drastic effect on the function of the domain or uh, an interaction. Uh, the stop loss, which is a loss of a stop codon, so you're actually getting a re transcriptional read through. Um, and so you're, what you're going to essentially have is an extra piece of protein. And again, the impact of that is uh, questionable. There is also missense uh, SNVs, um, where essentially, and this is probably one of the biggest groups, and where you're having modified just one amino acid. And then you finally have synonymous um, mutations where there's actually no amino acid change. But there could well be additional effects on the transcript um, that may not necessarily be aware until uh, you actually look at the protein itself. Well, sorry, once you look at the transcript rather than looking at the protein. Uh, so the, you may not see a loss in function of the protein, but you'll see maybe um, some other del deleterious effect because of the transcript either being more stable, or the fact that the, uh, yes, leave it there. There are also loss of function variants. Um, definition here is stop gain, frame shift, and splicing. Uh, they're definitely more disruptive. Um, but the question here is what? 
percentage of the protein is affected by these variants? Um, are there multiple transcript isoforms? Um, we do know that obviously that uh, genes are transcribed in different ways, and so um, we don't necessarily always aware whether that transcript being expressed in a particular cell type, um, but that variant has a particular impact because the splicing, uh, because the transcript isn't necessarily being expressed. Splicing events are pretty difficult, are somewhat difficult to predict. Um, and we do get sort of kind of cryptic splice sites, which are difficult to ascertain um, what the effect of a loss of function variant. Um, and sometimes um, frame shifts can be rescued by another frame shift. Um, so I, I used to do, when I used to do yeast genetics years and years and years ago, um, my job was actually to do mutagenesis. And so you'd spike the PCR reactions. And there was times when I actually would get this, we would actually get a frame shift in a early on, and um, there was a second mutation that actually rescued the first. So, um, and then theoretically, I mean, you can run gels to actually look at that, those uh, frame shifts, and you can see them, and you can sequence them to obviously identify those mutations. Um, but the actual functional impact of that mutation is, is, uh, is a question of whether it actually truly does cause a loss of function, or whether you actually, one frame shift is rescuing the other. Um, so, obviously the focus here is on missense variants, and when Yuri wrote this, it says, tell me more. I'm going to ask him what he meant by this, but I really, but it is, how do we tell if missense alters a protein function? And that's, that's the $64,000 question, I think, for a lot of us. Um, obviously, if there's a distinct mutation it causes a change in the amino acid, then there's possibly a constant, there's an at um, amino acid side group, the R group, is very different, and it could have a very deleterious effect on the, on the protein. Um, other things to consider are the conservation of particular residues across species. Um, if, you know, I mean, the assumption is that, you know, proteins Amino acids are conserved across species when they have a functional role. So if you have a mutation, then maybe you will have a, a larger impact on that, um, the role of that protein. Uh, particularly if it's in a conserved protein domain. Um, there are things like secondary protein structure, things to consider whether you impact on this. But I think most of the time, really, the, the big question is what is the impact on uh, three-dimensional protein structure? particularly with docking and drugs, interaction with drugs. And actually, I will say, because I've just, we've just written a grant for this for Reactome, that there's not that many pipelines which actually take into consideration the, to try and predict um, variant impact and then putting that in the context of a pathway. Most of the time, um, you're looking, when you're looking at, and certainly when we're looking at the tools, you're going to identify, you have a list of variants, you're going to identify those that have you're going to predict which have you know, some functional impact. And then you're going to look at the annotations that are associated with uh, different databases out there, whether that's gene ontology terms or pathways. But that's just a term. It's not telling you the consequence or the mechanism that could well be out there. So what pathway databases try to do is, you know, once you, your, your segue in is that there's a particular variant that's part of a reaction. And the question is, What's the, what's the downstream effect of you changing that, that particular biological event? Do you, get the product, do you get the same products at the end of the metabolic reaction, or do you upregulate a signaling event? And that's actually something we're trying to do with uh, Reactome. And maybe, uh, you know, once we actually get the, the project, if we get funded for the project, uh, there will be more to talk about then. Um, and then there's also other functional consequences of mutations, and that is affecting post-translational modifications. In the case of signaling, that could well be uh, phosphorylation, but um, there are a variety of other um, post-translational modifications that have huge impact on the genome, epigenetic effects. Um, so that's like methylation, acetylation residues. Could, that could have a huge... Excuse me. Those variants could have a huge impact on... Uh, different biological processes. Um, 
And then one other kind of more computational issue is um, the difference. Obviously, with all of the um, period prediction methods, there has to be a training. There has to be a, a computational approach, a machine learning approach. And the question is, what kind of training set do you use? And whether you include positive and negative data within that training set. So obviously, a positive data set is that there is a link, causal link between these variants and you know, this. You know, there are variants with a clinical impact. And then the negative data sets are things where it's not being demonstrated. The difficulty is that we haven't done all, we haven't looked at all variants in all tissue types and, and all diseases to know specifically. So sometimes the negative training sets are not necessarily the best approach to follow. Um, and just an example here, just in the graph, is just showing a particular mutation uh, for BRAF. Uh, this is a valine uh, to. Uh, now, in this case, we've got uh, glutamic acid change, which is a very distinctive change. So it is being linked to a pathogenic uh, phenotype. But then we have these other um, mutations, failing to an alanine, where you have um, basically an unknown role. So it hasn't been tested. So the question is, what's the impact of this mutation? So I would... You know, I would, if I were, well, again, also, and that's another thing to think about is the tissue that you're in. Because sometimes, just just hypothetically, um, that BRAF, uh, valine to glutamic acid mutation or substitution, could well be occurring in one particular cell type where it's been studied. And it's quite possible that, a, you know, a related or a different tissue in the body could have that same, same variant mutation, but actually doesn't have... Um, you're basically affecting a different biological event. So the outcome is different. So that's just something to bear in mind when we're looking at variants. All right. so now we're going to focus a little bit on conservation and some of the different variant scoring methods. So conservation is really a powerful, broadly used idea. Um, If, the, and really the goal here, I mean, not the goal, but the, the premise the assumption is that if the change in the conserved nucleotide is conserved, then it will have a change, you know, it could well have a kind of functional change, a functionally significant change on the impact of that protein. Um, and there are different uh, approaches to actually score that information. Oops. So there are at the UCSC, do you want to take it? <laughs> so there's file a P-score, which is very useful to assess um, single variants. There's PLASCONS, um, which is used to assess within putative regulatory regions and not coding, and, 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 and not coding regions. Um, that's actually quite useful when trying to understand the functional impact of variants found in non-coding regions. Um, and then obviously there's other multiple species alignment tools that are out there that are used. Um, now, UCSC Genome Browser is one of the browsers I like the most. Um, it's a very nice way of looking at uh, different gene features. And it's, well, in, in this case, if you're familiar with them, they have different tracks. So you can select to display different levels of information about the genes. Um, so you can look at particular coding axons, UTRs, and um, you know you can look specifically at nucleotides within the codons. And you can see, well, here's essentially at the bottom here is the concentration of the um, amino acids, and you can see the different tracks. Sorry, you can different tracks represent um, the protein sequence, uh, amino acid sequence across different uh, species. Obviously, the top here are the conserved eukaryotic, higher eukaryotic species, and then as you kind of go down into um, other lower eukaryotes. So, phylo P is um, basically one of the tests that's used to detect nucleotide substitution rates. Um, basically, you require an alignment of the sequence. Scores that essentially are being 
um, the score the score itself. Uh, typically, if you're looking at a conserved uh, variation a nucle or a nucleotide substitution, um, the score is going to be greater than two. Uh, if it's a neutral score, then we're going to see zero. And then for negative, like things are not conserved, then then they're more divergent and neutral. Um, we can also break down into different score groups, uh, species, uh, all vertebrates, and different mammals and primates. Yes. Uh, sorry, what's the neutral drift? That's a good question, um, and I'm going to have to defer to my colleague Yuri to actually answer that one. Apologies. Uh, I should remember my evolutionary genetics. Sorry, yeah. I teach evolution. Well, genetic drift is just the idea that you're having something outside of natural selection causing a change in the allele frequency in the population. So, classic example is like the volcano that kills off a bunch of people, and therefore you've got sampling of only a subpopulation, and so suddenly your allele frequency has changed. So presumably neutral drift would be that that's not happening. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. Conservation. So one of the main caveats uh, is if you use conservation for a given position, this will not tell you directly the effect of the variance, but only if the position is important. That's it. It just tells you whether and that relies on a load of other testing, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. So um, when looking at missense variant effects, different scoring models are here. Some criteria that are used are what features are used, whether you're looking at nucleotide amino acid conservation, whether you're looking at uh, specifically physiochemical properties, um, and then the different types of machine learning techniques that you could be using. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, the choice of the training set that you're going to use with that machine learning technique. Um, and actually, the, the example given here is things where you're looking for, um, when you're comparing activating and gain of function mutations versus inactivating loss of functions as well. And then things like Mendelian disorders. Um, where you can see prevailing loss of functions versus somatic mutations, um, which are significant in cancer. So the first method is SIFT. Um, it's one of the first widely used um, designed for identifying deleterious mutations, that is to say disruptive of protein function. Um, there is So basically, um, the approach is to start off with the initial protein sequence. They do a side blast to look for similarities in the sequence. Um, do a multiple alignment of the sequence, identifying orthologs and paralogs. Um, and after that, uh, creating a matrix based on amino acid residues. Uh, probabilities and um, for every residue um, there's an amino acid probability it's reweighted by the amino acid diversity and the position and its relative position and then finally uh, you get a probability score where the observed amino acid is normalized against the residue conservation now I have to be honest that's a lot more technical information than normally I can explain so I'm going to have to again defer to, 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 to Yuri to explain this one later. Actually, Yuri's probably going to listen to these slides and probably tell him I did Tell him where to go. Um, so polyphen is polymorphism phenotyping. Um, and actually, it, uh, it actually adopts a variety of different uh, sequence features. Um, and it considers a lot of other relevant gene uh, gene parts, so things like, uh, so uh, protein parts, I should say, because we're talking about domains. So take into consider things like domains, interactions, and three-dimensional structures, as well as the gene parts that I was talking about earlier. Um, this is where it gets interesting, because they are trying to use two different types, two different types of training sets. Uh, as far as I'm aware, it's the only one that actually has made some good progress with a positive and a negative uh, training set within the within the, within the um, 
uh, the HumDiv, which is the human diversity set. Um, so in the positive data, they're looking at particular alleles that have uh, known Mendel that support mo no that have an association with a known Mendelian disorder, and that information is actually getting pulled in from Uniprot. Actually, Uniprot is one of those really interesting resources out there that has a lot of uh, a lot of metadata associated with these different, uh, and actually a lot of cross references between what you traditionally think as protein sequence and other. Um, phenotypic annotations. It's actually very useful to look at sometimes. And then they've also got a negative training set which is looking at non-damaging differences between uh, human proteins and their related homologs in other mammals. Um, the human VAR training set again has two different uh, types. Um, this looks at all human disease causing mutations from Uniprot. And then obviously the negative is non-synonymous non uh, SNPs from uh, without disease associations. So it is a richer model than SIFT, um, but it does have a little bit more bias towards the training sets than SIFT. So both SIFT and Polyphen are probably quite useful approaches to take for identifying the impact of variants. And then this mutation accessor, it's a newer member on the block. Uh, it doesn't use machine learning. Um, it does consider Mendelian traits. It does link out to OMIM. Um, it uses the amino acid conservation uh, modeling approach uh, to proteins and, and incorporates protein subfamily information. Um, so it's a kind of regarded as an enhanced SIFT. Um, and again, an entry based score is a little bit beyond my scope. So I'll leave that one for Yuri to explain. And sends, overall, it tends to perform pretty well at recurrent somatic variants. Now, CAD is a new one, which I have to be honest, until earlier today, I did not know existed. Um, all I can really say from, from what I've just read, read over it this morning is that it, it seems, does seem to be a lot better um, than polyphen and SIFT um, at identifying deleterious uh, coding and non-coding sequence variations. Um, it does use a different machine learning technique um, and um, it does employ both positive and negative training sets. Um, and the predictive features are very wide ranging. Um, so we'll leave it at that. This, gr this graph is supposed to tell you that exactly that's what I've just said. Um, and we'll leave it there. Um, one other challenge with um, predicting the impact of uh, single nucleotide variations is the effect on um, essentially exon inclusion, ex inc inclusion, exclusion. So this is, um, you know, how does that nucleotide change affect splicing events? And basically, It's a very it's it's not sorry it's not it's not as easy to um, to identify the impact of these variations on splicing events um, and some of the the actual algorithms that are out there don't necessarily work with identifying the impact of these variations on splicing regions and finally um, some of the the impact, as I said earlier, is that these variants does sometimes doesn't necessarily have. Uh, well, the effect on the, sequ the protein sequence also has an effect on the phosph you know post translational modifications. For signal events, this could well affect um, post translational modifications like phosphorylation um, by default. Um, Yuri actually would be probably the best person to describe this because he actually did the work on this actually. But it does seem that there are certain changes within, um, amino acids that, sorry, let's say this. There are nucleotide changes that affect phosphorylation and protein modification sites. 
and typically they're not discovered by a lot of the mutation assessment file, assessment tools. So if Yuri had been here, he actually would be telling you how to actually identify that. And so I'm going to leave it there. Just summarize on uh, nucleotide level conservation is simple and a powerful approach. Um, obviously, it's important to look at multiple alignments and other uh, gene features uh, when looking at the impact of variants. Um, the MISCAN scoring models are powerful, much more powerful than identifying regulatory elements within regulatory elements or in splicing regions. And other things to consider when you're actually reviewing variant prediction is conservation, the effect scores from the different models, amino acid changes, the sequence context, whether you're looking at a protein domain, um, whether you're actually getting clusters of somatic variants, whether they're clustering to a particular protein domain. And obviously as well, as we're going to talk a little bit later, is to not to forget about the gene level information itself and also the other annotations that could well be up there. So apparently we're on a coffee break.